thank you all uh, for having me today. Uh, I was looking at the syllabus and list of speakers. Are you, you are lucky guys. This is a really cool course. I, I wish I'd had something uh, like this uh, uh, years ago. Um, as uh, uh, Josh mentioned, I'm going to talk about uh, some new economic thinking and, and why, we, why we need it, and specifically a way of thinking about the economy uh, known as complex adaptive systems. And I'm going to start with a little bit of motivation, a breakdown of Western capitalism. Now, given what you've covered in the course, I'm going to be very quick in that because I think I probably don't have to convince you uh, that much about, um, uh, about that subject. But then I'm going to get into um, how we might rethink economics in a more fundamental way, how that might lead us to a different vision of capitalism, of what it is and how it works. And then lastly, what we might need to do uh, to uh, fix it and change the system that we have. So first, um, and, and I'm going to just quickly run through some data primarily focused on the US. Um, as you can tell from my accent, uh, that's a country I know pretty well. Um, uh, but uh, a lot of this data is also relevant to uh, other countries in the Western world as well. So you know, one of the first uh, uh, signs of breakdown of our current economic model has been uh, what's called the Great Stagnation. So we had a period of of um, high income growth for, this is the bottom 90% of earners in the US, uh, all through the post-war period. Basically, as the economy rose, incomes rose. And then we have this sudden shift starting back in 1973, where incomes essentially flatlined and stagnated. Now, most people, a lot of people think that the um, economic issues, um, uh, you know, dissatisfaction in the economy really started around the financial crisis in 2008. This shows how far back the problems uh, have been, and, and that uh, for most families in the U.S., uh, they did not, they have not gotten a real pay raise since 1973, which is quite uh, extraordinary. Um, uh, and again, if we break down that pre-1973 and post-1973 eras, we see that pre-73 we had this era of inclusive uh, growth where the dark black line is national income per household, the, uh, the blue is again the bottom 90 percent, and then you see the top 10 percent, 1 percent, and so on. Again, you know, a rising tide was lifting all boats uh, during this period. Then something happened in the early 70s uh, where that relationship blew apart. And you see this runaway by the top. The purple line is the top 0.1 percent, then uh, you know, the top 1 percent, then the top 10 percent in red. The black line, again, the economy as a whole, and uh, the bottom 90 percent lagging uh, behind. Now, I gather um, uh, you saw this chart uh, in a, uh, uh, a lecture just the other week um, that um, uh, also at about the same time, the gains of productivity in the economy stopped flowing to workers and started flowing to basically owners of, of capital. Uh, another decoupling uh, of relationships in the economy was also profit and investment. Again, pre this kind of 70s, 80s era, when corporate profits went up, investment went up. When profits went down, investment went down, you know, uh, which makes perfect sense. But then, as you can see, that relationship started to decouple in, uh, in the 1980s and then blew apart in the 2000s, where profits went sky high, but investment uh, continued to drop. Uh, and as I'm sure you also heard from Bill Lazonic, uh, where did all that money go? It went into share buybacks and in other ways of returning uh, cash to shareholders rather than going back into the real uh, economy. Um, some other uh, important features of this breakdown of the, of the U.S. and, and bro more broadly Western capitalist model is, you know, we had the, you know, the huge debt bubble, the debt super bubble that burst in 2008 in the recession. We've had this hollowing out of the middle class, loss of middle class uh, jobs. Um, uh, what Jacob Hacker at Yale calls the great risk shift, where a lot of risks that used to be taken on the shoulders of government and on the shoulders of companies got shifted onto households, uh, pensions, employment security, in the U.S. health care. We've also had uh, an increase of, of, of risk uh, in employment, you know, gig economy, contract work, things like that. Um, we've had declines in, inve in real investment on a relative basis in both the public sector and in, in the private sector. And of course, we've got the great extinction going on with uh, climate change and in other environmental stresses leading to uh, collapse in uh, uh, species and ecosystems. So, um, you know, uh, a, a pretty um, uh, difficult set of problems uh, with our current economic model. And one way to characterize this is, you know, um, during that post-war period, we had a kind of capitalism was in a constructive mode. Um, uh, where uh, wealth was being created, broadly shared uh, through the economy. 
um, and uh, most people were participating in the prosperity of the economy, uh, to sometime in the, in the 70s to present, a more extractive uh, mode uh, of, of capitalism. So this then led to um, a breakdown in the social contract in, in politics. So my explanation of the kind of Trump Brexit um, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, populist phenomena is as follows, that uh, in the post-war period, we had an implicit social contract that, again, you know, if, if you worked, uh, did your job in the economy, paid your taxes, you know, tried to raise your kids right um, and be a respect, uh, you know, be a, a, a decent member of your community, you could expect, you know, that you're, uh, you'd have a reasonably secure life, your kids would do better than you did, um, and you know, that you would be uh, you know, re uh, respected in, in your community. That contract really started to break down in this kind of post-1970s period where people felt like they were doing all the right things. You know, I'm working hard, I'm raising my kids, I'm paying my taxes, and life isn't getting better. In fact, it's getting worse. More risk is coming on my shoulders. Prospects for my kids are declining. Um, you know, there's a phenomenon uh, known as the new precariat where you know, very, uh, households right in the middle of the income distribution have many pathologies associated with poverty, you know, insecurities from being one pay paycheck away from, say, losing your house or not being able to educate your kids and, and, and so on. And this has had real psychological uh, effects on people. And there's a body of psychological research showing that when people feel a contract is broken, uh, when a system is no longer reciprocal, uh, that when they're giving but not getting back, that uh, 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 real moral outrage is stoked. And you know, you've all seen it when, if somebody jumps a queue uh, waiting for the bus, um, what happens, or in the airport or something? People go nuts. You know, when they feel a reciprocity norm is violated, when they feel a contract is violated, it literally triggers biochemical reactions in your brain where you, you, know, uh, you, you feel a sense of moral outrage. You know, they can't do that. You know, I waited in line, I, didn't, I did the right thing, and they need to be punished. And we actually um, uh, feel a need to, uh, to punish and see the wrong uh, 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 corrected. And this feeling of moral outrage has, of course, been stoked by social media and so on. And this uh, you know, uh, building and, and widespread feelings of, of, of violations of reciprocity and moral outrage have helped uh, lead to the cycle of political dysfunction and breakdown uh, that we're in. So we have an interaction between a set of economic phenomena you know, the, the change in the deal that people had in, in their economy with a set of psychological and, and political phenomena to create this kind of toxic uh, stew. So what happened, you know, around 1973 when these trends started blowing apart and the model uh, really changed to change the social contract? Well, uh, we, you know, we know in the 70s there were some, you know, uh, uh, terrible fashion choices, questionable taste in music, really cool cars, other things going on. Um, you know, there was a, 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 an oil crisis and hyperinflation, but it's hard to see that, you know, the oil crisis or a bout of inflation could cause this kind of deep, lasting, multi-decadal structural change. So my hypothesis is that it was actually really a, a big shift in ideas, the kind of the intellectual operating system of the elites who, you know, run the economy um, uh, shifted uh, during this period, and we had the, uh, the, the rise of what's called the neoclassical synthesis in the 1950s and 60s, uh, and then a rise of what's been called neoliberal uh, political ideology um, uh, going up through the 70s and 80s. And these ideas about how the economy works and what makes a successful economy became hugely influential, and they really got wired into um, uh, politics, into universities, business schools, schools of government, think tanks, government agencies, the media, uh, the business community. Um, uh, it really was a kind of generational and epochal shift in the thinking that went on during this period, fueled and informed by these academic uh, and, uh, and kind of political uh, theory ideas coming, uh, coming out of uh, that community. And um, uh, my uh, claim is that those uh, ideas, this shift in I ideology, then gave justification and permission for a big shift in power in the economy and structural changes in the economy. So you had neoclassical and neoliberal economics uh, creating an intellectual framework um, that enabled uh, four big things to happen during this period of the 70s. One was the globalization of finance, the collapse of Bretton Woods, 
uh, uh, going to floating exchange rates and the huge creation of, of a banking sector. It's hard for you guys to believe in your generation, but the global finance sector is actually quite young. It uh, really didn't exist anything like in its current form uh, uh, pre-70s, uh, uh, pre-80s even. Uh, the second was the shareholder value revolution. Uh, before this period, companies were really run on a multi-stakeholder model, but there was a big shift, uh, and I'm sure Bill talked about this, uh, to a model focused solely on the shareholder as the only legitimate stakeholder uh, in the corporation and the goal of the corporation to create uh, shareholder value. That had a huge change in how companies uh, were run and also how companies treated workers um, uh, and, and the communities they were in. And, and I have some personal experience in this because I was one of the folks when I was at McKinsey going around rewiring companies you know, to do this, to maximize shareholder value. And basically, you know, we got really good at um, you know, suppressing worker wages, increasing productivity, that chart, and taking that wedge in between and shoveling it to shareholders. And I can tell you it worked. We were really good at it. Um, and then third is the neoliberal public policy agenda. So we also had a big change, most sharply in the U.S. and U.K., but to some other degree in, in, in some other uh, Western countries, um, you know, that changed how we do tax and, you know, big shift of the tax burden, uh, you know, from the wealthy to the middle class, deregulation of large sectors of the economy, decline of unions, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, increases in labor market flexibility that shifted risk onto the shoulder of households. And then last, um, but I think equally important or even more important to the other four, was a change in the kind of mindsets uh, of actors in the economy from what I would describe as a kind of virtue ethics uh, to more of a, a utility maximization model. That um, you know, the ethos um, uh, you know, really became uh, you know, like the, the, the 1980s movie, Wall Street, you know, greed is good. And as long as I'm you know, serving shareholders or... Uh, uh, things like that, that that gave me license to engage in a lot of um, a lot of questionable uh, behavior. Um, we can talk about more about that in the Q and A. But the sum total of these uh, structural shifts was it shifted power um, away from labor and toward capital, and rents in the economy shifted in that direction as well. Uh, and then th those rents have also since been used to really capture uh, the political uh, system. So we have this sort of chain from a set of shift in ideas through a set of, structure to, you know, set of structures in the economy to a shift in, in power and rents in the economy. Now, um, uh, I believe that in order to change this and change the trajectory of the system that we're in, we need to go back and change that intellectual operating system. We need to uh, rethink economics and rethink the ideas and assumptions behind a lot of our policies and how businesses are run uh, and so on. And here is my characterization of how traditional orthodox economics works. It essentially views the economy as an equilibrium system, like this ball settling into the bottom of this bowl. Um, and basically, uh, you know, my one slide sum up of, of uh, orthodox economics is you have a set of assumptions at the micro level that people are rational utility maximizers and that they're self-interested and atomistic. Um, and that self-interest is like the gravity pulling the ball into the bottom of the bowl. You then have the mezzo level, a set of social structures, notably markets that are efficient and self-correcting and firms that are optimally run, um, uh, and that any state interference is, is uh, causing uh, inefficiencies and welfare loss. You know, that, that mezzo level provides structures like the side of the bowl, constraints on the system. And then the macro uh, is assumed to be a linear adding up of the, of the micro in this system. And the natural state of the system is an equilibrium or state of rest where the economy is at full employment, markets are clearing, markets are efficient, uh, and everybody's happy. And that equilibrium state is just like the ball uh, settling at the bottom of the, of the bowl. And in fact, the mathematics behind uh, you know, much traditional economics you know, sort of uh, follows this, uh, uh, this framework. But um, we know uh, that a lot of the core assumptions underlying this theory are actually wrong. Um, so on the left, I've just listed you know, some, some uh, core assumptions, and on the right, what the real world data tells us. So people just don't behave like the rational actor model. You've probably uh, had some of this in this course or others. Um, they actually behave like human beings. Surprise, surprise. Um, and you know, we make decisions heuristically based on rules of thumb and inductively. Um, things like uh, our moral behaviors and emotions uh, play an important role in our decision making uh, as well as uh, rational calculation. Also, you know, we often don't have complete information 
in the economy. Um, and quite importantly, we are highly social uh, creatures that um, uh, we live our lives in, in networks, you know, uh, social networks in our personal lives, in our um, uh, work lives, uh, and uh, so on. And what makes those networks tick is our uh, other regarding behavior that, um, you know, we're constantly thinking about and worrying about, you know, what other people are thinking and doing. Um, you know, that uh, uh, these network structures in the economy uh, are constantly evolving, and it's not just markets and prices that matter, but other interactions in these networks matter. Um, markets are often incomplete, <coughs> and the um, micro, uh, 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 that the macro emerges from micro interactions. An illustration of this is, um, uh, uh, imagine a set of, you put a set of water molecules together. They don't make a whirlpool. What we call a whirlpool, a macro emergent pattern, is the result of the interaction of the water molecules. It's not just an adding up of water molecules. So the macro economy, things like booms and busts, employment, unemployment, stock markets, crashes, those are like a whirlpool. They're the emergent patterns that come out of lots of interactions at that micro and meso uh, level. And then lastly, the assumption that uh, markets find equilibrium. Well, we know that markets can be out of equilibrium uh, for very uh, extended periods of, of time. The 2008 crash was certainly not an equilibrium uh, event. Um, but unfortunately, even though you know, there's a lot of reason to believe that this core model is wrong, um, uh, there's, uh, uh, you know, it leads to a lot of kind of memes in the policy uh, space that are also wrong. So the idea that markets are always self-correcting that inflation is always a monetary phenomenon. You know, you have this trade-off between growth or equality. You know, you can pick one. If you're on the, you know, the right side of the political spectrum, you probably want growth. If you're on the left, you want equality. You know, that frames a lot of our politics. The trade is always welfare increasing. Uh, raising wages reduces demand for labor. I've been doing a lot of work on, and, and my uh, co-author on the minimum wage, and that's just simply not true. Um, you know, we talked about shareholder value. And also, you know, ideas that tackling climate change will cost growth and jobs. So there's a whole set of, um, you know, uh, memes that have kind of taken root in both the public discourse and public policy space um, that come quite directly out of these theories um, that uh, just aren't right. And so we'll cartoon to uh, illustrate that. Um, and finally, an equilibrium system cannot endogenously grow, it cannot create novelty, it can't create spontaneous order, and it can't spontaneously crash. So there's lots of things, you know, core things about the economy. Anyone who studied economic history knows that growth and novelty creation and spontaneous order creations are the big story of the economy that aren't well explained uh, in traditional models. Now, I, I'm going to very briefly present some alternative thinking and Simon's going to uh, go into more detail on it uh, and how we might apply it, but that the idea is that the economy is not what we've historically thought of it as an equilibrium system, but something called a complex adaptive system. And what we mean by this is that it's complex and that it is made up of lots of interacting uh, agents or organizations of agents, so all of you are agents in the economy as consumers, and workers, uh, members of households, but also people organize into networks of uh, firms and, and markets and, and other structures, that it's adaptive in that our strategies and designs uh, evolve over time. It's not uh, static. So, you know, your behavior, you may learn things over time and change your, uh, change your behavior. Uh, firms learn and, and innovate and, and, uh, and change over time as well. And that it's a system that um, uh, uh, the macro patterns emerge non-linearly uh, like the whirlpool uh, from the micro uh, behavior. And so, you know, is the, the ball in the bowl was my kind of little illustration for the equilibrium system. Um, the picture you get from this view is, is almost more like a biological system or an ecology or the brain or a forest. Um, it's a bottom-up system uh, of, of, of uh, lots of agents uh, collecting into higher level structures and networks nested within networks that are constantly evolving and interacting. And so you have these, again, these three levels at the micro individual behavior and in the complex systems we, we try to actually model humans as they really behave, taking insights from psychology and cognitive science and neuroscience. Um, you have these meso networks of institutions 
uh, and cultures that need to be uh, taken into account and taken quite seriously. And again, this idea that the macro uh, emerges uh, bottom-up uh, uh, in the system. And so the picture that you get of the economy is a very different one than what you find in the you know, standard uh, econ uh, 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 textbooks you might take in your courses here. Uh, that the economy is an unfolding process, it's dynamic, it's nonlinear, it's distributed, heterogeneous, networked. Um, uh, I love this word, autopoetic, which means it's self-creating um, and self-organizing, and that it evolves uh, uh, over time. Now, that's you know, a, very, a very quick blast of uh, a different way of thinking about uh, the economy. Uh, and I, you know, I should note that it's not just a conceptual framework or uh, theoretical, uh, but uh, you know, there's a pretty large community of researchers who are you know, doing quite concrete things with these ideas, building models, uh, using data, doing empirical analysis to try to more deeply understand uh, phenomena like why do you know, financial systems crash sometimes, um, why does economic inequality emerge you know, bottom up out of these systems and seem so persistent, um, how can we reconcile growth uh, and um, uh, sustainability uh, together uh, and so on. So uh, I'm now going to just uh, touch on if, you know, if one looks at the economy from this complex systems perspective rather than an equilibrium perspective, how it might change the way we think about capitalism. Now, uh, in the first part of my talk, I was very critical about our current model of capitalism, um, but I'm actually not critical of capitalism generally, uh, because uh, we also know that um, uh, market uh, capitalism has been hugely effective in raising very, very large numbers of people out of poverty. Um, first, in what uh, historians call the great enrichment uh, between the mid-1700s and um, uh, the 20th century in the West, but then also more recently, in, in, uh, uh, particularly in China, with hundreds of millions of people coming out of poverty into a middle-class uh, life. Um, but understanding you know, that capitalism works and, and uh, can you know, ha be a huge engine of, of wealth creation and, and shared prosperity is not the same as knowing why and how it works or how and why it works. And you know, the traditional economic explanation has been its efficiency and allocation um, and it's about atomistic competition that are the two key sort of driving forces. The complex systems view would r rather say it's actually been capitalism's ability to innovate and evolve over time and be adaptive, and also its ability to harness uh, human behavior into cooperation. Capitalism's real genius is getting lots of us to cooperate together to help solve each other's uh, uh, problems, and I'm going to talk more about that uh, as we go. So the next point I want to make is that um, we need to rethink what actually prosperity is and what we mean by it. You know, when we, when we talk about prosperity, we tend to think about it in monetary terms. Well, you know, somebody's prosperous if they're rich, if they've got a lot of, a lot of money. But um, another way to think about it is that real prosperity, what really matters to us is what my co-author and I call um, solutions to human problems. And, and let me give you an illustration to uh, get this concept across. So this is a, a hunter-gatherer tribe, uh, the Yanomamo, in uh, the rainforest in Brazil. And they live a lifestyle you know, pretty much the same that hunter-gatherers lived you know, tens of thousands of, uh, uh, of years ago. And in your daily life as a hunter-gatherer, you face a number of problems to be solved. How do I get myself fed? How do I keep myself safe? How do I stay healthy? Uh, you know, how do I have fun? Um, and, and so on. And uh, in the hunter-gatherer lifestyle, you have a set of solutions that your society and culture have evolved to those problems. So to get food, you hunt and gather. Shelter, you build a straw hut. Health, you go see the medicine man. You know, transport, you might have a canoe. Uh, and uh, for entertainment, we can all dance around the fire and have a, have a jolly time. Um, and it doesn't matter how much, you know, if, if we parachuted one of you down with, you know, say the average income in the UK, you know, whatever it is, 50,000 uh, pounds for a family per year, it wouldn't matter how much money you had, you know, this would be the set of solutions you would have. It doesn't you know, matter whether you're the richest person in that society or not. You know, that's kind of uh, what your life is going to be like. But even a relatively poor person here in, in London has a very different set of solutions in their set. 
um, for food, you go to a supermarket, um, shelter, you, you know, might have an apartment, you can go to a hospital in the NHS, you can take the tube, you know, you have police to protect you for your security, and you have lots of options uh, for your entertainment. Um, so what really matters is your material condition of living, these solutions to your problems. And um, uh, if we measure in pure monetary terms, and anthropologists have tried to do this in various ways, you, you could say roughly the guys on the right are 500 times richer than the, uh, 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 the guys on the left and the guys on the right. Uh, but measure it in kind of the solutions that are available, and I do an estimate of this in my book, it's actually 10 million times. The, the sort of uh, variety and choice and ways of solving your daily problems is much, much richer uh, and more varied and more effective in um, the uh, industrial society. And what capitalism is really ingenious at is coming up and making available new solutions to human problems and thus raising our real, lived material prosperity. Um, I'll also note that solving problems is not just something done by the market. Solving problems is also done uh, by the state or, or, or government in, in lots of cases as well. Um, and just to again, uh, you know, nail this home, you know, these are real increases in prosperity, tangible increases. To go from sweltering in the heat to having air conditioning, to dying from infection, to being able to, you know, for two quid get a, uh, you know, a dose of antibiotics. You know, from walking everywhere to bikes, trains, and cars telegrams to phones, email. I'm not sure Facebook actually may be, you know, prosperity reducing in my experience, but, uh, you know, going to the library to having all the information in the world in your pocket. And my co-author, uh, you know, likes this one, soggy potato chips to crispy potatoes. So it doesn't have to be, um, you know, it doesn't, you know, that these um, better solutions to human problems for prosperity, they don't have to be all like huge things like invention of the internet. They can be, you know, hey, uh, you know, a crispier potato chip makes my life better. Um, uh, they can also be small things, too. Um, and if we think about prosperity in these terms, then the purpose of capitalism can be thought of as to provide solutions to human problems. That's what it's for. What do we want an economy to do at the end of the day? Why do we want an economy? It's to help us solve our problems, make our lives better, make our you know, material experience uh, of life better. may not always make us happier, and as, you know, you guys may have talked about the literature on happiness and all that. Um, you know, uh, happiness and, and, uh, depends on a whole complex host of things, some of, only some of which are material. Um, but as far as our material life goes, the purpose of capitalism is to provide better solutions to human problems. Wealth, then, is the accumulation of these solutions. And we can think of it as growth as the rate at which new solutions are created and made available. And then we can think of prosperity as that set of solutions that a society has uh, access to. We can also then uh, go back and think about the purpose of business and investment. It's not to maximize shareholder value. Why do we want businesses? To solve problems for us. You know, uh, you know Apple uh, you know, solved the problem of, of giving me a way to you know, uh, uh, process and, and, and share uh, information. And, uh, um, you know, the company that made this water bottle has solved the problem of giving me uh, something to quench uh, my thirst. That's the goal of business, is to solve our problems. And markets and governments together create an interdependent evolutionary system to help support and provide a structure for this problem-solving uh, process. Now, um, uh, how am I doing on time? Yeah, you've got plenty of time. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, now, um, you know, another thing that this, this way of thinking about things helps with is, um, you know, traditional economics focuses on price as the measure of welfare. You know, basically, if, 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 if something has a price, then it's got to be valuable to society. Uh, and that's how we measure GDP and, 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 and so on. And um, the problem with that is, is uh, it, it doesn't necessarily help us distinguish between good things, you know, what we intuitively know is good and bad economic activities. Um, so, uh, you, know, um, uh, 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 you know, the famous example is, you know, uh, crime goes up, more people put locks on their doors, that's GDP enhancing because, um, you know, you have to spend money on the locks, but that's not really, uh, 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 you know, creating a social, uh, you know, social value. Or um, uh, Mariana Matsukato used this one in her lecture the other day. She said, you know, um, uh, if... Um, uh, somebody marries their cleaner, 
uh, GDP goes down, you know, because the work isn't is no longer priced and counted uh, in uh, in the in the national uh, accounts. And we have also bad ec economic activities, you know, that we know are socially harmful that do get priced uh, and and uh, counted. So things like you know cigarettes or polluting activities. Um, you know, or if I create a, a fancy derivative product that makes me a lot of money but, you know, blows up the financial system, you know, that's counted as good for GDP, at least in the, sh in the short term. So, but if instead of uh, we think about things in, in terms of solutions to human problems, we can then ask, um, um, you know, is my solution creating a problem for somebody else? You know, uh, if I create that derivative, it may solve a problem for me, but it may create a problem for all of you. Um, or if, you know, I set up a disco in my back garden, you know, to solve my problem of wanting to be entertained, is that creating new problems for my, for my neighbors? Um, uh, also, we can ask, is my solution today creating uh, problems for tomorrow? You know, are we storing up, you know, short-term solutions? Are we creating problems for uh, future generations? And we can also then, and this ties back to Mariana's uh, work on, uh, recent work on economic value, it helps us distinguish between kind of real economic value creation versus just rent seeking. Um, so for example, high frequency trading. You know, try to explain to me what human problem that is really solving. You know, it's just a way of, of skimming rents uh, uh, out, of, uh, out of the market. Now, um, if, if you, you know, if, if we buy this idea that um, problem solving is really what increases human prosperity and capitalism's job is to give us new and better uh, uh, solutions to human problems. The key to making that work is human cooperation. There's not many problems we can solve by ourselves. Um, uh, 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 I, I once went on um, safari in, in, uh, in, in Africa and a uh, uh, guy in a Maasai tribe tried to show me how they make, you know, some of the wonderful artifacts that they have. Um, you know, he, had, he, he made his own arrows for his bow and arrow. And I tried to make these things, and there was no way I could, I could do it. You know, I, you can't just walk into the, you know, into the woods and pick up a stick and know how to make something like that. You need other people to, you know, teach you, and you need a whole network uh, and a whole culture to transmit uh, that, uh, uh, that knowledge. And to make, you know, more complex things like, you know, this, this artifact, uh, takes you know tens of thousands of people uh, around the world, uh, building on a huge heritage of cooperative uh, knowledge and activity. Um, uh, if you want to entertain yourself, there's a great video on YouTube. A guy named Thomas Swaites, who tried to build a toaster from scratch, um, uh, completely by himself, and starting with the most basic elements. So he literally went out and uh, mined some metal out of the ground. Um, and um, uh, made his own plastic from, you know, uh, potato starch and other stuff, you know, got copper ore to make the wiring, uh, and so on. And this was, he was trying to replicate a five-quid toaster. And this is what he made. Um, uh, so this is what you get without cooperation. It took him, I think, two years uh, of effort, and it probably, you know, cost him, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. I mean, he had to, like, fly around the world to get, you know, the materials and stuff. Uh, and then he finally, you know, the great moment came, and he turned the thing on and tried to make a piece of toast. And it, it started toasting for a few seconds, and it just exploded and nearly burned his house down. Um, and uh, it's, it's really a, a fun video. It's a, a TED, <laughs> TED Talk. Um, uh, and his message from this exercise was, it takes a civilization to build a toaster. And you know, I think it's a really, really important message that um, most of the solutions we have to problems like how to make toast or how to you know, get from point A to B or just about anything in modern life requires a huge amount of cooperation. You know, here's uh, a Boeing 787 and just showing where all the parts come from and, um, and this is even at just a very, very high level. You know, the network of cooperation to make this thing is just, uh, just immense and global. So, Inclusion uh, and a fair social contract are fundamental to capitalist prosperity. Uh, and, and the reason for that is if capitalism is about solving human problems and it takes cooperation to solve human problems, then you know, we're not going to have good uh, 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 cooperation unless people are included, unless you have a fair social contract. And uh, you know, the dimensions of inclusion are not just economic, but also social and, and political. 
And you know, when, you, um, when you do it right, you get a virtuous circle where um, inclusion uh, helps support reciprocity and fairness. That helps support cooperation and trust. That, in turn, helps lead to you know, more and better problem solving, which raises our prosperity. And um, you know, we, we call this the, you know, the, the kind of virtuous, uh, virtuous cycle of, of, of problem solving that really is the engine of, of capitalist uh, prosperity. And you can see it more easily by seeing the reverse of that. I'll challenge you in the Q&A to name a society that's been highly exclusive and had unfair social contracts that was also innovative over any extended period of, of, of time. Instead, those societies tend to ge degenerate into rent-seeking. You know, you get predatory elites um, who then become focused on preserving their position and power and privilege and extracting as much out of everyone else as they can. And um, you know, political stability in those kind of exclusive economies also requires a, you know, a, a degree of authoritarianism. And so we also think that this need for inclusion in fair social contracts helps account uh, for the uh, you know, link between successful capitalist models and, and democracy. Um, I don't know if you had them read Asimeglu and Robinson, um, uh, uh, Why Nations Fail, very good book. Uh, and it talks about the importance of inclusion uh, in, in political settlements and why um, uh, 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 that in, uh, including people is core to uh, democracy and we would argue it's the, also the core to successful uh, capitalism. So uh, just to wrap up, um, you know, what does this mean? Well, um, we think that uh, this needs a, a, you know, leads to a shift in thinking at least as big as the one that happened in the uh, in the 60s and 70s, or you know, potentially even bigger, um, that uh, by understanding the economy as a complex system and capitalism as a uh, system for solving human problems, that uh, the old notions of left versus right just kind of go out the window and they don't really make any sense anymore. That instead of those debates about market versus state and left versus right, we should be debating how do you best foster inclusion and fairness and, and trust to get that virtuous cycle spinning. Um, and how uh, do we, you know, we recognize that the market and state exist as a kind of ecosystem and we should be focusing on the effectiveness of that ecosystem rather than seeing it as a competition uh, between the two. Uh, we need new ways to measure the economy and tell us are we doing better. You know, we, I'm sure you guys have been talking about the inadequacies of GDP, but how do we measure real um, increases in human prosperity, solutions to human problems? Um, uh, you know, thinking about uh, uh, market effectiveness and innovation rather than just markets uh, is about efficiency and allocation. We need to go back to a new sense of purpose for firms, to think about them as providers of, of, of uh, products and services that solve human problems and therefore accountable to all the stakeholders uh, involved in that. Uh, that employment uh, and, the, and the social contract between workers and their firms is a key means of inclusion in a capitalist economy. Um, and also that uh, it, you can't have a fair social contract and inclusion unless you have a moral foundation to that. So moral fairness has to be a, a core part of the system. The kind of idea uh, prevalent in economics that markets are sort of a, you know, amoral or exmoral system just really doesn't uh, hold. And then finally, uh, that the economy is not separate from society and the environment. You know, climate change is not an externality. It's not something separate that rather the economy is a complex system embedded in the larger complex systems of society and the environment. So a pretty big shift in thinking. And also, uh, we need uh, a broad set of, of reforms. Um, the models I, I think of for this are, um, you know, that one of the geniuses of capitalism is it does uh, evolve. And we've seen in the past uh, reform programs such as the Progressive Era in the late 1800s and early 1900s in the U.S where reforms across all elements uh, uh, of the system, education, tax, labor markets, et cetera, can drive the system uh, to uh, a new state. So you know, how do we, uh, on each of these areas, ask a set of questions about how do we actually uh, create policies that support uh, 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 inclusion, a fair reciprocal social contract, um, and effectiveness in uh, problem-solving uh, uh, innovation. And you know, uh, what makes me uh, optimistic, although we're in a you know, pretty uh, difficult period right now, is that you know, we have seen these cycles of crisis and reform before in, in history. Um, 
uh, and, uh, 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 and we have seen capitalism emerge better uh, from, uh, from these cycles in the past. But they do require um, uh, very strong political leadership and very strong civic engagement. When you look at these previous periods of crisis and reform, they weren't just done top down by you know, uh, uh, policymakers and politicians, but they really were a mix of some good leadership, but also quite a lot of bottom up uh, uh, action from civil society, from business, from the education establishments, uh, and, uh, and so on. Um, if you're interested in reading some more about this, um, uh, I wrote a book a number of years ago about how to think about the economy as a complex system. Um, my uh, collaborator, Nick Hanauer, has written a book about uh, what these ideas mean for politics called The Gardens of Democracy. And then we've written a few pieces on this idea of capitalism as uh, solutions to human problems. Um, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>